so Jeremiah Foster, for those of you who don't know him, is a local boy, um, a New England product uh, in a global industry. Uh, the, uh, the community manager for the Geneva Alliance and an open source technologist at Luxoft, and that means right in the middle of the nitty gritty of all of this. Uh, and uh, the person I know best who has fought the, you know, you really ought to think about GPL3 in your cars wars in the most deep and lengthy and profound way in this complicated industry. So that's the last voice that we need so that then we can really have the conversation. Jeremiah? Thank Thanks so much, Eben. Um, these events are amazing. I've, I've been working in the automotive industry for, I think, I don't know, close to 10 years. And this is the first time I've actually spoken directly with a lawyer from an automotive company. And I'm, oops, excuse me, I haven't even spoken with him yet. And now he's going to sue me because I spilled water on the mouse. Um, okay. Thanks. Let's see. Shall I F5 out? Escape out. Thank you. I can't speak extemporaneously like even, so I need slides as a crutch. Plus, in this industry, um, the cars that are, are made nowadays, I'm gonna have to go online, I'm afraid. The cars that are made nowadays and the, and the concepts are, are so amazing that it makes any presentation look really great. <laughs> so I'm cheating, but hey. I don't know how Professor Ogre does it, but um, he seems to have the ability to create a, a thematic uh, presentations. Uh, the, f the fall event that they usually have has, has been remarkable in getting, without much explicit intention, to getting presenters to, to speak <clears throat> um, in a way that the talks actually connect a great deal. And I think this one is connected a great deal. Really grateful for, uh, for Daniel's show up today. Uh, it's fantastic. I can't tell you how important it is to hear actually from somebody who knows this industry very well. And of course, um, Mr. Shuttleworth, somebody who's done so much for free software, I was at a talk he gave, I think it was in 2004 in Gothenburg, Sweden, um, before Ubuntu was launched. And if you ever get a chance to see him speak, as you have, but always do, he gave a talk that was intertwined about his trip to space and what we need in the free software community. And that was the launch of Ubuntu. It was one of the best. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and don't worry, your English is tremendous. And nobody speaks English as well as Professor Moglin, by the way. So <laughs> uh, no shame there. Um, Want to make it abundantly clear that you can feel free to rip me off. Um, this is sort of uh, virtue signaling because I've ripped other people off. So off we go. What? What the heck is going on? Why are we here? What does it matter? I mean, I think the big thing is, is digitalization. Uh, there are a bunch of other things, electrification, uh, ECU consolidation. There are a whole bunch of industry buzzwords that are fundamentally transforming uh, automaking. And it, it's very, say, it's very foundation from a material science, from an engineering, mechanical engineering driven industry into a software driven industry. Um, this may seem obvious, but it's truly profound. This, I think, even was talking about, say, 20th century versus 21st century business models. And here we are. Um, this, of course, doesn't scale, but it certainly is a um, almost an idyllic view of the days of yore. Here we are today. Um, already, we've lost a lot of freedom. Those, this system down here is, is in Gothenburg, Sweden. Um, and it can read your license plate, knows the speed you're going. It'll send you, uh, send you a bill in the mail if you try and cheat. I think they do that up on the Henry Hudson Parkway here in New York now. But um, a lot of things are happening here. And obviously, software is coming into play. We still have two radios and transponders and such talking to each other. But now we get to the next step. And everything is digitized. And you just have somewhere. Um, two blockchains or a block, you know, a signature on a blockchain is signed and all the money goes to the right place, presumably. 
So this is where we are today. Um, and as complex as cars are to build, the infrastructure, infrastructure around them is perhaps equally as complex, if not more so. I think Elon Musk says, rockets are hard, but cars are really hard. And I think that is very true. So digitalization uh, happening all around our society in a real profound change, something that I think that we've been calling for for a long time, certainly with regard to, to certain industries, is happening apace. And the next thing that digitalization has brought is connectivity. And, and cars, this is, cars are no slouch. They are extremely sophisticated machines. And they, they test their systems and use all this connectivity and networking in ways that your ordinary computer doesn't even come close. I mean, if you've got a Bluetooth phone that you're streaming your music on to the head unit, it's carrying that stuff through a fiber optic network, so there's no electrical ma magnetic interference inside the car. It may be recording simultaneously FM band, AM band. It also, you know, will have uh, a hard disk on side. It will have very detailed maps. For example, uh, your Google phone may be able to guess where you are within roughly 100 meters, maybe 10 meters. But the car can do it often in 10 centimeters. So the size of an orange, it can locate you with its GPS. In autonomous driving, it's going to be even more detailed, and the maps themselves will be significantly more detailed. So, you know, this is, it's very, it's amazingly complex and it's amazingly difficult. And I think sometimes we need to step back and um, be grateful for the work that the car companies have, have volunteered to take on. They're certainly getting pushed by external companies, I think. But these two forces, connectivity, digitalization, um, are really turning cars into software-defined ve defined vehicles. Here is something from McKinsey, a gentleman named Georg Dahl. Georg Dahl used to work for Luxoff, but he also worked in Geneva with us. And um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, software already represents a significant portion of the vehicle. In fact, cabling is the third heaviest element in any vehicle. It, it's, uh, it's a huge part of the cost, and it's going to rise. Roughly now, I think it's about $1,000. The cost of the vehicle is software. That's expected to rise um, to about 5000 Electrification also. And that points to um, the fact that uh, cars have to serve, <laughs> I mean, they, car companies have to serve not only customers, well, obviously customers, hugely, but they also have to serve uh, the jurisdictions in which they sell cars. I think Daniel pointed to that recently that there are multiple jurisdictions. And if China decides that all cars are going to be electric, well, <laughs> you're going to make a lot of electric cars. Um, and you probably won't make money if you can't. And electrification helps to change um, the entire ecosystem, of course. Naturally, you're going to have uh, a whole set of things, but user experience, software-defined vehicles, the car being just another node on the network, shared mobility, all these catchphrases come in to heavily influence the way cars are being made. Now, as these car companies that are, quite frankly, rather profoundly good at mechanical engineering, uh, we joke about them bending metal, and they sort of cast dispersions on, on some of their suppliers who are just making sand. You know, silicon is just sand. What are you, who are you people? But um, that represents the dynamic, obviously, between their, their business partners and suppliers. But as they've transformed themselves from mechanical engineering um, and that intellectual property milieu into software, they've, they've recognized something profound that you need an ecosystem. You can't just rely on a small set of suppliers, which they traditionally do. You know, they're called tier ones, and tier ones and tier twos. That dynamic is is clearly being disrupted. Um, and I think that while car makers prefer that, you have issues of liability. You can go to your supplier and say, hey, do this, or hey, we'll 
charge you a lot less if, or yeah, will ask a lot less money if you can produce on this time frame or what have you. I mean, that relationship is very powerful. And in fact, it binds uh, the car makers in a great deal. Sometimes there could be money on the next project that you take off or you get added on, what have you. But car makers recognize that uh, they need a complete ecosystem. They need to have multiple partners. They need to be reliable and they need to be uh, focused on their needs. And there was really no balance of the kind of customization and flexibility as well as reliability and quality software that was available like I believe the, the FOSS ecosystem has. And with that comes copyleft, of course. And I think the analysis of it is pretty good. One thing about the car companies that I find amazing is um, not only as they adopt open source, GNU Linux, free software, they, they tend to um, they tend to, well, they've understood copyleft, I think. Let me put it that way. They've, they've adopted that as well. I think um, Daniel's analysis was pretty good. The problem I see it is, or one problem is, is that they're all building the same software. <laughs> they're all building their own GNU Linux stacks. And they're all using the same approach to licensing and compliance. I think that um, we can build a, a broader, I think that forums such as this are important to build a broader coalition across these industries so that people can sort of peer into that black box and understand that there's standard ways to do it, there are best practices, and that we really should be collaborating more. But you can see how copyleft um, would be a, a dramatic challenge, I think, to an industry that's mostly mechanical engineering that has long release cycles. Uh, one of the things that car makers do is that they're very good at getting together in organizations. Uh, automotive grade Linux, for example, has, I think, had a profound effect. So is Geneva. O-Saddle, you'll hear from um, Mark McGuire, excuse me, Nicholas McGuire. And uh, there's also something called Autos are, and they do fundamentally low-level networking and some operating system stuff. Um, and what Janimi has done is it's taken some of the stuff that Autos are specifies. Specifications are very important, and requirements are very important. And they've turned that into open source. But I think it would be more important for Autos are itself to become an open source organization. I think there's some interest in, in getting that done. It's not there yet. Um, but I think that it would help a great deal with some governance challenges. Um, and here we can also start talking about other issues that were pointed out earlier and how do you graft a process designed for safety critical software development uh, with their own standards like MISRA C um, onto the open source system. It, it's, nearly, it's nearly impossible. You have to do sort of a reverse engineering approach. Uh, you certify process, you certify hardware, so it's, it's much more than just uh, putting the software and saying it's compliant. Um, you have to have, uh, yeah, you have to have a, an ecosystem around it, and then you also have to have requirements. We don't really use requirements in open source. Most of the time it's just a developer saying, wouldn't it be cool if my software did this? Um, it doesn't work that way when you're getting your so software certified against ISO 26262. And let's point to some of the draconian reactions, I feel, um, the reactions to GPLv3, uh, which was the panic reaction I think you talked about. That's blacklisting GPLv3. And I think that's really the situation we are quite broadly in the industry today. Um, if we outline some of the governance challenges, maybe we can find some solutions. The, the shell of protections that surround a vehicle is uh, quite robust. Um, the stakes are incredibly high. This is not a phone that where you miss a call. The, the stakes are much, much higher. We're already in certain levels of autonomy. So you have ADAS systems, assisted driving systems, uh, lane change avoidance. You have cars that will detect the speed of the car in front of them and keep a safe distance at certain miles an hour. You have Volvo City Safety 
So you have tons of these safety systems and then security systems built on top of them. And as BMW calls it, they call it a shell. And anything that disrupts the integrity of that shell, um, including support, you have to have a support contract that goes beyond the start of production. You have to be able to support your system for 10 years. You know, Qualcomm makes chips. Their software development cycle is roughly six months. How are you going to establish a support system for 10 years or 12 or 15, which ought to be the life of a car in many cases? Very difficult challenge. Um, and I think it's completely reasonable that there is that integrity. And I think that the solution that... Uh, Mr. Shuttleworth talked about today is really needs to be seriously looked at because I think it could be quite elegant. Then how do you graph the process of, as we've spoken before, how do we actually <clears throat> create new safety certified, functional safety software onto the open source process? I think not enough has been talked about there. We, we don't even have tooling, for example, free software tooling for handling requirements. Um, and I think everyone agrees, I think there is consensus, Professor Moglin, that uh, blacklisting GPL v3 will not work. Um, one of the reasons I think it won't work is because software is incredibly useful in safety. Uh, as NASA says, you know, if you do it right, it's sometimes the best hazard prevention system. So I think that while there are significant challenges to maintain the integrity of the security and safety shell. I think there are also huge opportunities, and I think we can't really rely on that barrier to entry, that moat that a lot of industries are putting up, especially in IoT, against the innovation that's flooding through uh, GPLv3. Um, and fundamentally, I think, as we speak of security, as someone said, proprietary software is an unsafe building material. You can't inspect it. I think we're going to need to inspect our software. I think if the vehicle is driving you, I think you're going to want to have some trust in that. I think car makers are experiencing uh, a bit of skepticism from the public regarding autonomous vehicles. And I think that safety and security are going to be ways they're going to sell uh, new autonomy. And Certainly the shared mobility folks are. And I don't know that we're going to get there without being abundantly clear to consumers, to industry regulators, to insurance companies, to uh, dealers, to anybody, if we don't have the ability to introspect the software. That's why that later talk this afternoon, I think, is going to be absolutely important about introspecting AI. But we have methods and means to introspect software today, and that's sharing the source code. I think that uh, that's an extremely important tool that we need to use. So here's an approach that um, is not used <coughs> by Canonical and Ubuntu. This is from Yocto. Here we can see uh, a disparity. This, this layer, as it's called, is a way to pull in a bunch of older software. And they say right here, um, by splitting this into a separate layer, it's hoped that people realize these may not be the best solution to the no GPLv3 problem. Um, it should also make it clear there's a different quality of service applied to these recipes. So what's happening is that there's a, a project um, started by open source, or yeah, operating system vendors. And operating system vendors were the people that car companies really turned to first. Companies like Monte Vista, Wind River, um, Mentor Graphics. They're all gone, by the way. Wind River was bought by Intel. Monte Vista left the automotive industry, sold their automotive works to Mentor Graphics, and Mentor Graphics was bought by Siemens. So um, operating systems vendors, uh, the business is not what it used to be. Let's put it that way. Anyway, they created a very powerful tool that they used to create their own distros, custom distros, which they would maintain. Very expensive process, instead of saying taking a distribution uh, built in the open like Debian. Um, but it, you know, it's a quality tool, it's useful, it's carried on today in a in project called Yocto, and essentially creates uh, layers, commingle software. 
And as more softwares become GPLv3, they've had to create GPLv2, or a set of layers for GPLv2 that allows people to avoid GPLv3 software. Well, you know, even with this sort of disclaimer, this is still widely used. And th I think the danger is, is quite real. But this is uh, an example of how, where we are today in the state of the industry. Um, we've seen a lot about anti tivoization I think that there is a way to get around it, if you will, but I think that getting around it is not really, um, I don't know, I, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think that in fact, um, GPLv3 was built very powerfully to be more GPL-like, in, in other words, modifiable. And I think that there's a great opportunity to address anti tivoization with that. Um, but I do think that we ought to represent, uh, and as Mark said earlier, you know, people have legitimate concerns, people have legitimate interests. Uh, and these, I'm trying to represent them as clearly as possible. And I, I'm trying to distill that anti tivoization requirements create an unacceptable safety risk, even though I think that there uh, are ways to address that. And these are them. You can craft an exception. It's not really an exception. It's additional permissions, um, which I think is quite elegant. And you add additional permissions that say you're permitted to um, remove the requirement to provide the installation information. I think that's really interesting. You do have to have uh, appropriate copyright permission. So if you're writing something under the GPL v3, you can craft it that says, okay, I'll provide an exception to section 6, well, which allows you to remove that particular provision, which could be extremely useful for getting certain free software uh, made available at all. In fact, we've done this at Luxoff. We have a small safety critical certified system which can serve uh, telltales, which are important parts of, of the car, showing your brakes. And the value there is not really in the software. The value is the fact that it is gone through the certification process. So if you were to take the software, GPL v3, and put it in your car, you know, even without regard to the license, you're not going to get anywhere because you have to certify your car. You have to certify your hardware. You have to demonstrate your process. And you'll need a great deal of expertise. And there's time and money. So that's a very powerful impetus to make sure that uh, the software produced and that the certification process is sustainable by the company that does that. Then I still think that we need to discuss GPL compliance in large complex systems. I think that's something that the automotive industry has found quite difficult. I think that the fine grained detail uh, as shown in Ubuntu core is probably the only real way to manage it in that regard. Um, currently, it's, it's very difficult and licenses shift. Um, and there was a, a talk here recently saying that some licenses don't even have stewards so what happens if there are issues found? Who do you go to? Who do you turn to? Um, these, are, these, I think, are still some real concerns. There are also, though, some opportunities there. Uh, we've seen Canonical's approach, but there are other organizations as well. Open Chain at the Linux Foundation. Um, that, I think, has found wide adoption, especially in Asia, in Japan, and in China. Uh, there's Common Cure which is really, I think, sort of based upon the principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement, and that is to essentially treat GPL enforcement um, as one does with GPL v2, excuse me, GPL v3, which is, you know, it's a better license, it's a very good license, uh, and it, it's perfectly reasonable, and this is a great approach, and I think um, industry is, is very, it's, it's really adopting it in a great way. In a great way, really bigly. Um, but finally, to quote 
Anthony Nartot, I think we need a, to bring in some disruption, a, a suicide hand grenade. What do we do when we have full autonomy? What happens when the car maker is also the owner of the car and runs the shared mobility service? There is no distribution point as we traditionally have with software. There's no tier one or tier two delivering software to the car maker. Instead, they're producing it, they're making it themselves. And then what happens with new data protection laws as the GDPR happening in, in the EU and in fact their new industrial data type almost or, or new industrial data law that industrial data in the Internet of Things actually has its own set of licenses or own set of ownership that can be separate even if it's about the car that you're traveling in and it's your car's exact position. I think um, we're going to have to look quite closely at that because as we've seen, data is the new oil. Uh, our personal data is extremely important. Um, and who's going to hold the liability? When, when you don't own the car, what rights do you have? Uh, I think um, we need to have even stronger protections around data and around uh, inspectability as we move closer and closer to autonomous vehicles, uh, not just because of the important safety aspects and security aspects, but because of the rights of the passengers. And that is my talk for today. That's good. The comedy portion of the program is over. We can move on to some good questions with the we could, except we need to give people time to use the bathroom. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you.